<clears throat> Kenzo Tange, 1913-2005, a giant in uh, Japanese architecture, which has many giants, uh, in fact, more than any other country. They have the largest number of Pritzker Prize uh, laureates than, than any other country in the world. How do you explain it? Well, it's not complicated. They suffered a lot in the Second World War, and now, of course, uh, they suffered also because of their, uh, you know, decisions to fight on the wrong side. But uh, other other countries did did so as well, and they didn't wake up to what Japan did wake up. They are also ravaged by tsunamis, by uh, earthquakes, and yet this country is miraculous. Everybody knows that Japanese architecture is is is. Uh, uh, a playground, uh, a lab of uh, various experiments. Not all architecture, of course, uh, you know, the commercial architecture is commercial wherever, but still they have very significant architects. Even now they push the boundaries. So Fujimoto, Toyo Ito, Kazuyo Sejima, Ishigami, you name it. Why is it that they can do it and we cannot do it? Well, because we are stiff because we are still obsessed by uh, Peter Zumthor and Olgiati, you know, those uh, old ladies of, uh, of uh, European architecture, if I can call them so. <laughs> there are many other architects in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the world that we don't know of and we don't talk about, and it's very, very sad. And Kenzo Tange is one of them. Kenzo Tange was a hero, and you'll understand why. So, Kenzo Tange, born the 4th of September, but as you can see, he died on the 22nd of March in 2005, just 16 years ago, and that's why we talk about him today, was a Japanese architect and winner of the 1987 Pritzker Prize for Architecture. He was one of the most significant architects of the 20th century, combining traditional Japanese styles with modernism and designed major buildings on five continents. His career spanned the entire second half of the 20th century, producing numerous uh, distinct, distinctive buildings in Tokyo, other Japanese cities and, cit uh, cities and cities around the world, <clears throat> as well as ambitious physical plans for um, uh, Tokyo and its uh, environs. Uh, Tange was also an influential patron of the metabolist movement. He said, it was, I believe, around 1959 or at the beginning of the 60s that I began to think about what I was later to call structuralism, a reference to the architectural movement known as Dutch structuralism. But the, the metabolism movement in, in Japan was, um, was different, actually, from the, from the Dutch uh, structuralism. Influenced from an early age by the Swiss modernist Le Corbusier, who also, of course, influenced Tadao Ando, who even named his, uh, his dog uh, Le Corbusier. Tange gained international recognition in 1949 when he won the competition for the design of Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park. He was a member of SIAM, Congrès International d'Architecture Moderne, in the 1950s. He did not join the group of younger SIAM architects known as Team X or 10 though his 1960 Tokyo Bay plan was influential for Team 10 in the 1960s, as well as the group that became uh, Metabolism. Now, I want to say this. Here we, uh, we are 40 people. 40 people, this is not a small number. My, my provocation to you, my, uh, uh, my uh, challenge to you is this one. Why is it that we cannot also create, uh, uh, um, you know, movements in architecture in, and in culture in general? Why don't you write a, a manifesto, a manifesto for your ideal architecture? You know, uh, secluded in your own room now that there is the pandemic, you think about an architecture that you'd like to do. Don't follow the path, the, you know, uh, traced by someone else. Think with your own mind, feel with your own heart, use your passion, use your knowledge, and, and, and write something or draw something. It's important to create. It is very, very important. Otherwise, life is not worth living, really. These Japanese, you know, they still move the world, and they move the world 
uh, with with original thinking and 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 I, I wonder why we cannot also do what they do and here he is actually <laughs> On the left is the building that uh, Vatsal, who is here now, I hope he's still here, uh, made a presentation on this building because it's a famous building by the Corbusier in Ahmedabad. And uh, I found this uh, slide, uh, this image on, um, uh, on the web with the young Kenzo Tange with a camera, uh, probably visiting uh, Ahmedabad and the works of his beloved Le Corbusier. <clears throat> I am asking you, why do you think Le Corbusier still fascinates us? After all, he didn't have a diploma. He didn't study in an architecture school, school, not even for a second. So why are we fascinated by him? Because he, we are, this is the truth. Why do you think we, we, we can start a discussion now? Why is Le Corbusier- no. Please turn off the microphone unless you want to, uh, to, to, to answer my question or say something. Hello, I hear some noise in the back. Uh, if you want to say something, please do so. Otherwise, please turn off the microphone. So I am asking you, and we can talk after the presentation on Kenzo Tange about this, because today I will also talk about the cousin of Le Corbusier and partner. They worked for many years together, Pierre Genre. Uh, so my question to you, and you can think about my question, and after I finish my presentation on Kenzo Tange, we can interrupt for a while and have a discussion. Why is Le Corbusier still provocative and inspiring? Why are we still talking about him? Okay, I will continue now my presentation. And if you want, uh, when I end this presentation on Tange, we can, uh, we can maybe have a, a discussion about this subject. Why was and is, continues to be relevant Le Corbusier? Why do we still talk of him? Why did Kenzo Tange go to Ahmedabad to photograph this building? And he probably went to other places in the world to see the buildings of him, his beloved master. Why is he relevant? Did you ask yourself, yourselves? Okay, I will continue. Here he is, uh, an older man, but with the face of a child, with, with that wandering face. Uh, I love this face. I mean, look at the expression of this face. This is the face of a man who still has wonders at the world, uh, a man who finds amaz amazing the world. And indeed, the world is amazing. We just have to see it with fresh eyes, to enjoy everything, the tree, the sky, the sunlight, the, the grass, the, the winter, if it comes, when it comes, the snowing, and so on, the birds, even the most insignificant and bothering little insect on the floor, even that is a, 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 you know, an incredible event in a way. How do you explain that a little dark point on the, on the floor, I mean, it's just a, like a dot moves. What makes it move? What makes that insect move, that little nothing, you know, move? Isn't it incredible? Anyway, uh, I like Enzo Tang, it's true. Here he is also kind of a young man looking at a building he built. Uh, and uh, it, this Japanese, and he was not the only one, there were others. And I, uh, I a few years ago in uh, Sala Frescelor, I, 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 I a whole month I talked only about the Japanese uh, architects. They are very inspiring. They are very inspiring because they are very creative, very non-conventional. You know, they, they, they are not timid, they are not uh, stiff. And I love this and they are very hard working people. You know, I mean, the Japanese work uh, just like the Germans, you know, they, they, they work forever, they, they were alcoholics. They are very serious, but they are also very innovative. Uh, and uh, we, I find inspiration in such people, you know, because, and they are not, they understood, the Japanese understood that architecture is a, is a phenomenon which is connected with other branches of knowledge. It's not just about, you know, erecting a wall. That's why if you look in the Japan Architect or A plus U, very important architecture magazines, 
you will see that the Japanese architects always have some kind of philosophical background that they rely on. And their buildings are informed by a very old culture, as you know. Here they are, the metabolis. I want to see the students in Romania and young architects in Romania, and not just in Romania, just like these five men here, you know, with a, with a utopian uh, project behind them. You know, they are heroes, they are samurai. Maybe I, I idealize them, and to an extent I probably do. But I love these people. I mean, they, they were creative, they were highly creative. They innovated something. They gave birth to the world again. I mean, just try to imagine Japan after the Second World War was in ruins. They had the atomic bomb dropped on two of their cities. Hundreds of thousands of people died. And this country in a few years became the second economic power of the world. How do you explain it? Well, through sacrifices, through very, through very hard work, and they understood something which we do not understand. They understood something which China also understood more recently, that unless they technologize themselves uh, with immense speed and intensity, they will not be able to make it. But the, the objects, the, the whatever it was that was made in Japan, you know, where you saw made in Japan, you knew it was excellence. You know, uh, whatever it was, a radio, a cassette player, uh, anything made in Japan was made incredibly well. Why? Because they cared, because it was scru a scrupulous activity with the highest standards. We could do the same thing, but we don't do it because we are not animated by the same intensity. We could, of course. Yes, we could. The Chinese understood the same thing. That's why China now is, uh, in my opinion, economically is already at the top of the world. And uh, in architecture, as you know yourselves, they are doing incredible things. Uh, we, you know, we, we can lay on the sofa and watch uh, soap operas and in extreme boredom, uh, I don't know, eat uh, popcorn, but that's not, that's not what uh, legitimizes uh, one's life. These people, you know, I mean, the Japanese, they are not very tall, they are not, they are, but, but there is something in them, you know, this quest for excellence. And Tange is, is in, right in the center in, in between these five people. I don't know if I recognize any, any others. I don't, I only recognize him. But bravo to him, we move forward. This is what he said. Architects today tend to depreciate themselves to, to regard themselves as no more than just ordinary citizens without the power to reform the future. Now, let's talk a little bit about this. Why is it that architects are trained as being slaves? Because this is what the schools of architecture do. They train the architects to be the slaves of the so-called reality. But as Wolf Prick said, reality doesn't make us. us. We make reality. An education should be that uh, that uh, that uh, engine that that uh, 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 pulls reality after it. You know, uh, so education is extremely important. The architect was always a cultural figure, and it lost. The architect lost that status. Why? Because of his her own mistakes. That's why. Because for for money. We think that we are supposed to be the slaves of a capricious and usually a cultured uh, so-called beneficiary who can abuse us. It is not so. An architect is supposed to be a person of, of high culture, of high passion, of great talent and intensity who reforms society. And this is what Kenzo Tange says. Architects today tend to depreciate themselves to regard themselves as no more than just ordinary citizens without the power to reform the future. Obviously, he thought that the architect can reform the future. And I would say not only that the architect can, but also that the architect should. This is, this is the intrinsic uh, core of what the architect is. You are supposed to reform the world, to change the world, as, as the phrasing goes. Not to become, you know, that um, 
bone on the chess table of, of the world that uh, anyone can just move around now, now, and now again. And, the, and your professor should tell you the same thing, make you uh, intellectual uh, and cultural figures who can defend you, the nobility of, of your profession. We move forward. There is a powerful need uh, for symbolism just a second, this keeps showing up here and uh, I don't know, okay. Uh, <clears throat> there is a powerful need for symbolism. And that means the architecture must have something that appeals to the human heart. There is a powerful need for symbolism and that means the architecture, again, I don't know why it is uh, twice uh, written here. Anyway, let's, let's talk a little bit about symbolism. How many of your projects in school talk about symbolism? I don't think too many, but I think the symbolism is very important. Is that psychological, spiritual uh, dimension of your work, which matters. In fact, is the most important. If that is missing, you are not really working for architecture. And you see, he says, must have something that appeals to the human heart. Heart, not brain. He says exactly the same thing like Frank Lloyd Wright and Le Corbusier. Both Le Corbusier and Frank Lloyd Wright underline the heart, not the brain, the heart. And here is Kenzo Tange saying the same thing, appeals to the human heart, trying to make projects that speak or sing even to the human heart. Forget the brain, really. You know, there is the saying, uh, the, the wording, uh, brainstorm. No, you have to have heart storm. The brain is not really storming. The brain has its, its raison d'etre, yes. But the heart matters the most. That is passion. And this is exactly what Kenzo Tange said as well. Inconsistency itself breeds vitality. Now, what about this? This is a curious statement, no? Inconsistency itself breeds vitality. I think you should tell this to your professors where a professor says, where did you see something like this? Or don't you see the other projects around? You know, they are all consistent. They all follow a certain way of thinking. Then you, you could tell that professor, I'm sorry, professor, but Kenzo Tange said inconsistency itself breeds vitality. What, is, what, what actually is inconsist inconsistency? It's breaking the system. It's breaking the box. It's freedom. This is what it is. And it's e including the freedom to make mistakes. In fact, mistakes, mistakes are necessary. We, we have even in our culture the saying, you know, so it's better to make mistakes searching for something that uh, expresses yourself or something new than to do something without making any mistake, but in, in, in essence, uncreative. So uh, I, I repeat what Einstein said, if you didn't make any mistake all your life, it means you never tried anything new. So the fear of, of being, uh, you know, uh, of making mistakes is actually the fear of living, living. If you live, you make mistakes, inevitably. But those mistakes are part of life and they generate vitality. So I would encourage you to be inconsistent in the sense, don't follow the whatever system is telling you. No, no, go the other way. Turn your back on, uh, on uh, you know, be a black sheep. Don't be a white sheep because it is the black sheep that in the end triumphs. It's always like this. And the great heroes in a culture, not just architecture, in any field are usually the black sheep. So uh, here it is, uh, something about the Ise Shrine. Um, I don't know if you know, in Japan, the primordial god is actually a goddess and is the sun goddess. In European mythology, the sun is male and the moon is female. But in Japan, the sun is female. And the goddess is Amaterasu. And uh, Ise Shrine, which is one of the most beautiful buildings ever built, I truly suggest to you to, to search for the Ise Shrine in Japan, was dedicated to Amaterasu. 
and I have myself a beautiful book, which was, uh, in fact, is mentioned here, uh, uh, was uh, edited and uh, maybe even sponsored by Kenzo Tange on the Ise Shrine. So let me read. It's important because it has to do with the mythological core of the Japanese culture. So the Ise Shrine, in 1953, Tange and the architectural journalist and critic Noboru Kawazoe were invited to attend the reconstruction of the Ise Shrine. The shrine has been reconstructed every 20 years. And in, it's true, uh, it's an interesting story about the Ise Shrine, but about this in detail some other time. And in 1953, it was the 59th iteration. Uh, normally, the reconstruction process was a very closed affair, but this time the ceremony was open to architects and journalists to, to document the event. The ceremony coincided with the end of the American occupation, and it seemed to symbolize a new start in Japanese architecture. In 1965, when Tange and Kawazoe published the book Ise, Prototype of Japanese Architecture, which I like and is an unbelievable book, he likened the building to a modernist structure, an honest expression of materials, a functional design, and prefabricated elements. Now, what happens about the Ise Shrine is this. There are two identical uh, plots of land, one near the other. On one is the, the Ise Shrine, and the other one is empty. And every 20 years on the empty plot of land, they build exactly a structure like the one uh, in, 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 on the plot of land, uh, uh, on, the, on the adjacent plot, plot of land, and then they destroy that one. So this goes on for um, uh, more than 1,000 years. That's why they had, you know, uh, you know in 1953, uh, uh, the 59th iteration of this process. So in this way, there is always an Ise shrine which looked identical with the one that was first built, I don't know, in the years 900 or something like this. Kenzo Tange, the Tange house uh, in Tokyo from 1951 to 1953. So this was his own house. And although he was skeptical that uh, uh, significant architecture in the present can inspire itself from tradition, he was still anchored in the very serious and deep and meaningful uh, tradition of his own country. But, and I keep saying this, tradition has the same etymological root with the word treason. So tradition, in order to be alive, it needs to rejuvenate itself through, through treason. You have to betray something. And, and it, it is in the act of betrayal that you innovate. And, and by innovating, tradition be, remains and becomes alive, not dead, not stiff, not dogmatic. So this is the house, you see. Uh, of course, it's a house built not, not uh, too long after the, the Second World War and uh, the, when, when the country was ravished. It's modern, but it's also connected with, uh, with uh, what preceded it, with what is called tradition. I like this house very much. It's, it's uh, on pilotis, like Corbusier said, but here there is wood and uh, it's, it has a level of, of, of flexibility. Uh, so he was an innovator. And look at this, it has dignity. It is, uh, it's, it's still a house which uh, would function very, very well with the standards of the present. Uh, the tatami room. The Japanese culture, as you know, is very sophisticated and, uh, and uh, in its simplicity, in fact, there are meanings uh, sometimes quite complex. So this was the house built by Kenzo Tange for himself uh, in the 50s, so about 70 years ago or so. The, as you know, the Japanese uh, architecture is beautiful, both the old one and the new one. Uh, look, the, this, this was the site plan, quite, uh, quite generous, considering that it is, uh, it is in Japan where the land is not so, uh, uh, you know, uh, abundant. 
but he was by that time already a personality, so she, he, he afforded it. Now, I don't know what this is. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know why this picture is here. It's not a site plan. Uh, there must have been a reason for this. I don't think it's his, uh, his building there. Or it is, maybe. It, it, this is the building he built for the um, memorial, well, the House of Peace in Hiroshima. And try to understand the, the incredible suffering that happened then, you know, to have two atomic bombs dropped on, dropped on two cities in Japan, Hiroshima and then Nagasaki. And on Tokyo, other kinds of bombs were, were dropped. So the country was totally leveled. You know, and uh, and uh, and yet this country was able to come back to life, and and I remember when the tsunami was ten years ago, when uh, also there, there was uh, they had uh, an explosion at the atomic, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, they had some facilities for to produce atomic energy, and there were explosions, there were infections, thousands of people died. Uh, many crippled, the tsunami also produced a lot of victims, and the Japanese didn't complain. I have to tell you one thing, I am from Sibiu, and, and the Japanese offer 1 million euros every year to the, the International uh, Theatre Festival in, 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 in Sibiu. They even send volunteers to Sibiu, and in that year, 2011, I was sure because of the tsunami and because of the big tragedy there, they would have been justified not to send any longer so much money to, to Sibiu. And they still did, even if the country was ravished by the tsunami. This is exceptional. I mean, we are, we are dealing here with people who value uh, the, the world very, very much. They, 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 you know, they prefer to sacrifice themselves instead of not uh, keeping their word. And the culture of the samurai, I mean, these people could have died for their honor. And in fact, many did. Not to be honorful, uh, you know, to have honor would, would have been uh, inconceivable for them. So uh, maybe, I mean, not maybe, we can learn a lot from them. So the Hiroshima Peace Center from 1949 to 1956, so it took uh, you know seven years to build. This was built by um, by Kenzo Tange, clearly a modernistic building. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if you saw pictures of uh, of, of the effects of the of the atomic droppings on on Hiroshima, uh, <clears throat> dead bodies, you know, burned bodies, you know. Uh, ashes, human, human, human life totally, uh, uh, you know, uh, destroyed buildings and buildings and buildings. Everything was, 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 was in ruin. Uh, some months ago, I, uh, for some reason, I, I, I asked a friend of mine to publish. I was, I was, I was talking, I was planning to talk about Hiroshima. And I sent a, a young architect who publishes on face, Facebook some of my announcements. I sent him a picture with um, uh, dead bodies, uh, you know, uh, as a consequence of the bombing of Hiroshima to publish on Facebook. And his, his account was frozen, was, was blocked uh, because, uh, because uh, Facebook considered that the picture we sent to them was so-called undecent. <laughs> Can you believe it? I mean, dead bodies who became dead because of the atomic bomb, Facebook considered as being undecent. Undecent was the, the lack of sensitivity. And the lack of sensitivity, and, and to say they were undecent, is not enough. The pilot who dropped that bomb, not the I don't know if you understand this culture of lying, because this is what Facebook is doing, is lying. If you tell the truth, the painful truth, not the convenient so-called truth. If you, don't, if you show pictures of, of your little kitten or, uh, you know, white little curly dogs or, uh, you know, things like this, they are published immediately. But if you send them pictures, that show the horrors of the Second World War, they will not publish them because they are unpleasant. 
you know, because truth is unpleasant. I, lo I don't like Facebook at all. I don't have the at all respect for, for, for what they do there. You know, this culture of make believe, you know. Anyway, uh, here it is, the building of Kenzo Tange and bravo to him. It's still a, a clear conception. It's a, it's a clear cut building. It's, it's strong, it's yet sensitive. It's not an arrogant building because it's, it's horizontal. It has dignity and it has the dignity of its creator, Kenzo Tange. Look at this, it is the house of peace. These people who were decimated by the atomic bomb rebuilt their city and uh, Tange built their house of peace. Bravo Kenzo Tange. And now Hiroshima is a totally reborn city, you know, it's like you know, like a miracle city in a way. It was, you know, and, and you, can you understand the immense suffering? I mean, especially of those people who didn't die, but they were crippled by the, 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 the atrocity of the atomic bomb. How could you drop a, an atomic bomb on 100,000 people or 200,000 people, you know? How, how, I, I mean, how, how did that, that pilot uh, feel. I know he, he respected his contract with the army, but still, I think uh, certain things cannot be uh, cannot be done, should not be done. Of course, the Japanese were not saints either. I mean, they were involved with the Nazis, and you know, they they created themselves a lot of suffering, because that's how it is. You know, uh, uh, one horror is the, the birth of another horror. Uh, you know, it's always like this, uh, an unending uh, uh, vicious cycle of horrors. So get to our center from 1955 to 1957. I have to tell you uh, that period uh, between the 50s and 60s in Japan is miraculous because it was at that time that the Japanese architecture was truly a heroic architecture. Uh, and uh, everything they did was was uh, with very high standards. It truly, I am sure these people, they sacrificed their lives, if we can say so. They gave themselves to, to the act of creating, of giving birth to a new Japan with everything they had. And they succeeded. I mean, even today, you know, if you talk about electronics made in the 60s in Japan, they are unbelievably functional still unbelievably well made. And they were made not by, um, uh, you know, extraterrestrials, they were made by human beings like me and you. And yet, I don't know, the level of excellence was miraculous. Even now, I mean, they can build anything. These Japanese can build anything. In Imabari City Hall complex by Kenzo Tange from 1958. Look at this, so-called brutalist architecture. Well, Yes, it, it has concrete, it is heroic, it is masculine, it is rhythmical, uh, but uh, sorry, the pictures maybe are not great, but still you, 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 you get a feeling about what he was doing at the time. And look at this, you know, it, it, it is a building that says we are still up, we are still counting, we are still here. We, uh, we made our uh, mistakes in the past. Uh, we were ravished by the reaction of uh, those who opposed us, but we are back. And they are back through very, very hard work. I worked for a Japanese firm uh, in, in, in New York for a few years. And I can tell you, these people work forever. Uh, out of 24 hours, my boss was working for 18 hours, nonstop. Every day, not uh, five days a week, every day. Kaga, Kagawa Prefectural Government Office, be, be, uh, Japan in Kagawa, uh, 1958. Uh, this is, uh, you know, you would say a more predictably, you know, more modernistic building. Yes, 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 maybe. But also, um, and it is structuralist, this building, it's true. What is not structuralist is the, you know, the, the landscape design with the, with the big stones and then the water and so on, which is more romantic and sculptural. But you will see other buildings by him which are different from this one. This is a government building, but it, it still has a Japanese touch, a Japanese spirit. You know, it's not done with wood, 
but it has some lightness, so to speak, derived from the, the wood, wood structures of, of Japan. And uh, yes, stones with water always add, add a lot to, to, to the environment. You see here, you know, it's, it's uh, transposed into concrete an architecture that uh, you'd almost expect to be in wood. <clears throat> Although he died in 2005, uh, his office, architectural office, is still uh, uh, functioning. In other words, his legacy goes on. Kurashiki City Hall from 1960. I like uh, this one, uh, or no, I think, no, it is this one, but yes, um, sorry. Uh, you see the, the, the plans are very simple, but uh, if you see other elements, section and so on, you realize that there is a certain complexity here at work. I mean, it is not for uh, no reason that Kenzo Tange received uh, the Pritzker Prize in 1987. Uh, yes, it is a still kind of a brutalist building, but we have to consider that Japan was emerging from after the war, and so it had to have something robust. It had to be to its architecture had to be robust. It it couldn't express weakness because it, it had to emanate force. It had to emanate, uh, uh, you know, uh, confidence. You know, if they didn't make an architecture that was uh, uh, standing up, so to speak, uh, you know, uh, you can imagine the architecture does have an effect on those who pass by, on those who look at. And this was a, you know, a governmental building. It has, it, it was supposed to have a certain degree of of, uh, of, of power. Now, maybe if he lived today, Kenzo Tange would not have built in this way, would not build in this way. You will see the city hall in, 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 uh, in uh, Tokyo that he built, uh, you know, before he died uh, in a very different way than, than what he did here. Some housing from 1961. Uh, sorry about this. Uh, this is a little bit, you know, row houses. Maybe they are not very typical uh, for Japan, but uh, even here we see uh, a robust form of urbanism. The buildings are not big, but there is a certain vigor here, and the rhythmicity is uh, is. Uh, it's maybe not typical for Japan, but uh, I think uh, a valuable addition to the many urban schemes for uh, this, uh, this theme, meaning housing. I mean, this could have been also in an European city uh, very well. Well, they are not so typically uh, or typical uh, Japanese. 1963, Nichinan Cultural Center, uh, this one is interesting because it has, you'll see in the elevations, you see almost two triangles or two trapezoidal uh, figures that, uh, that go in, in different senses. So uh, there is already an architecture of conflict, uh, a dynamic uh, architecture. Look at the section. And uh, so this was from 1963, almost 60 years ago. And uh, look at the, uh, you know, the, the, the power of the, of, yes, concrete is problematic because it generates a lot of pollution. But uh, at that time, uh, concrete was not seen in, in these terms. And, uh, you know, it's a fortress. That's what it is. It, it is a fortress. Thank God he didn't make, uh, you know, such a building with white Greek columns or whatever. No, this, this is a fortress which connects with the, you know, the heroic side of the Japanese spirit. And the austerity sometimes, although there is another side to the Japanese spirit, which is very delicate and even decorative. 
and we see some examples right here in this picture with these flowers. But the building itself is, uh, is um, uh, indeed austere and fortress-like, very much so. It's a bulwark of resistance. It's almost as if the building says, you know, we, we were defeated in the war, but uh, we, 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 are still, uh, uh, we are still here. At that time, it wasn't just him who built in this way. There were other Japanese architects like Arata Isozaki, who is now almost 95 or so, he's still alive. Another Pritzker Prize laureate, he, he received the Pritzker two or three years ago. Kenzo Tange's buildings will make you believe in a better future. This is what this person wrote. And uh, Yes, I think it is because of his heroic stance, you know. Uh, th these are not buildings that uh, try to give you delusional little delights, no. Uh, they are buildings that uh, tell you life is difficult, life, life is rough, but there is an optimism in this uh, raw architecture that Tange, uh, that Tange built. He even built a cathedral, and you are going to see it. And in my opinion, his cathedral is much more convincing than the cathedral we are building now in Bucharest. Why? Because there was a great architect who built it. Who is the architect of our cathedral? Nobody knows. Can you believe it? A cathedral that was built by we don't know who. Now, of course, in the, in the Middle Ages in France, and not just in France, there was uh, anonym, anonymous uh, authorship of the cathedrals, but for different reasons. In our cases, <laughs> it's something incredible. So we Japanese architects in our endeavors to resolve the problems facing modern Japan have devoted a great deal of attention to the Japanese tradition and have in the end arrived at the point which I have sought to elucidate for you. These are his words. If, however, there can be detected a trace of tradition in my works or in those of my generation, then our creative powers have not been at their best. Then we are still in the throes of evolving our creativity. I want, by all means, my buildings to be free of the label tradition. Now, how many people in Romania say this? Not too many. You know, we are still pathetically you know, entrapped in all kinds of nostalgias. Nostalgia is good too, but, but so is uh, being uh, living in the present, you know, and expressing the truth of your own time. Anyway, Olympic Arena. Now we, are, we are going to see now one of his best works ever. From 1961 to 1964, even Japan changed. Last year, it was opened the stadium which was meant to for the Olympics of Tokyo from 2020, but because of the Olymp because of the pandemic, uh, it was postponed for this year. Let's let's see if this year it will happen. But the the new stadium, Olympic Stadium in Japan, was built by Kenzo Kuma. Kengo Kuma. Uh, if you compare what Kengo Kuma did last year with what Kenzo Tange did. 60 years ago, you will see the difference between the Japan of then and the Japan of now. The, the freshness, the power, the creativity, the exuberance of Kenzo Tange's work is not matched in any way by what Ken Gokuma did. Par partially, Zaha Hadid said by copying what her winning entry, uh, because she won the competition, but the Japanese didn't want to let her build uh, her project, so they, they gave the commission to, to Ken Gokuma, who built a, a mediocre stadium. But look what, look what Kenzo Tange did. 
you know, there are two buildings. I mean, look at the plan. It's a vision. It's simple, but it is, uh, there is exuberance. There is an idea here. It's organic. Uh, it's, uh, look at the sections. Look at the spiral. They inspire. Here is a, a work of a vision. It is a work that is, uh, you know, not a little uh, scribble, you know, derived from who knows what influences. There was a clear conception here. And then look at the interior. It's magnificent. And the exterior is just uh, the honest expression of the interior. And that's it. Look at this. It's great architecture. It's dynamic. It's organic. It's uh, technologically is advanced. Uh, it's simple and complex at the same time, as it should be. And look at them. There are two buildings. Bravo to Kenzo Tange. Unfortunately, Japan itself, as I said, changed. The Japan of today is not the Japan of that nine of those 1960s when Kenzo Tange built these two stadiums. So I guess, you know, uh, this is the story of the world. What goes up goes uh, down, you know. Uh, Jap Japan itself, although is capable of brilliance, is not as it used to be. I saw once a movie, a very interesting movie, Japanese movie, where a group of 10, let's say 10 businessmen, Japanese businessmen enter a restaurant and they enter the restaurant in the hierarchical order, you know, with a boss in the front and then, you know, uh, less and less important people towards the end. And they asked in the restaurant uh, what kind of champagne, they were celebrating something, what kind of champagne they wanted. And uh, the, the waiter brought a list with the champagnes they had. And the leader of the company and of the group knew nothing about champagne. He worked all his life, 18 hours a day, if not uh, 20 hours a day. He, he, he knew nothing about champagne. <laughs> Uh, nor did those in, in his uh, immediate hierarchical uh, order. The only one who knew about champagne was the last man in the group who was actually those, the, the young man who was making Xerox copies. He knew about champagne. So it's a, it's a, it's a great metaphor for what, you know, how the world changes. Those who brought Japan out of the misery and the tragedy of the Second World War they didn't have time to learn about champagne. They were hard workers, but their sons and daughters and the grandsons and daughters, of course, they began to know about champagne because Japan became an economical power. The money came in and so on. Anyway, bravo to, bravo to, to, to Kenzo Tange uh, and uh, you know, his, his brilliant work. And look at this. This is brilliance. That's what it is. You know, uh, it's all, uh, there are two audacious structures and uh, they make sense. They are not capricious. They're just beautiful and they continue to be beautiful because they were based on a, on a, on a, on a generous idea. Now, I don't know. Uh, ah, yes, this, is, this was the stadium uh, uh, proposed by, uh, by uh, Zaha Hadid which was, uh, which was not built, actually, not that it was demolished. Too bad. It would have been another brilliant work, but, uh, uh, and didn't I tell you Japan itself changed? Yes, it changed. They didn't have the courage to commission Zaha, and she won the competition, actually, for the, for the stadium. No. And uh, instead, Ken Gokuma built a pathetic, uh, weak, uh, mediocre stadium. Sad. I mean, the buildings by Kenzo Tange still stand out. The small Olympic arena, um, this is, uh, we, I mean, look at this, <laughs> you know, it's, it's the work of man, but it is as if God made it, you know, it, as if nature made it. Now, I told you about the cathedral. Now, look how a Japanese man who was certainly not a Christian, he built a cathedral. And he built a cathedral which would put us to shame and with good reasons. Why? Because his cathedral is creative and ours is not. 
I mean, it is incredible that we are building here in Bucharest what we are building. It's just unacceptable, totally unacceptable. Architectural creation is a special form of comprehending reality. It works upon and transforms reality through the const construction of a substantial object of use. The artistic form of this object, on the other hand, has the twofold quality of both mirroring and enriching reality. This understanding of reality, which takes place through architectural creation, requires that the anatomy of reality, its substantial and spiritual structure, be grasped, uh, grasped as a whole. You notice the word spiritual. This is a word we should use also, but we don't. Including in the world, in the in the in the in the in the study of architecture in our schools, how many of our uh, teme de proiectare mentioned the word spiritual? Not too many. Uh, look again, uh, a section through the building. You see the the site plan, and you see pictures of it. It's it's mysterious. It's dark. It's luminous towards the outside. Is 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 is, uh, is um, sculptural. Uh, it is a building which is new, which is modern, which is because it is built in the 20th century. Dear uh, Preafericitule, uh, uh, care, uh, sorry, I'm beginning to, to lose it because I am mad that uh, Romania lost a great chance to build a, a, an important cathedral. This is a small building, of course, in comparison, but it has a genuine uh, uh, creative spirit. Very much so. I mean, you know, the bench is everything, the, the gla gla stained glass window, the, the walls, uh, everything is creation, pure and simple. And you, you don't need a lot of words or I don't know what iconographic material, you don't. And this is what you get when you have a creative spirit at work. The cathedral of 15,000 square meters and the capacity of 600 seats was built between 1963 and 1964. One of the things that struck me, this is what he wrote from the church, especially when compared with other Catholic cathedrals in Europe, Latin America, or Asia itself, was its secluded, its secluded character. That is, there is no, not a square or a public open space preceding the cathedral, as it is common in the Western tradition. On the contrary, the church is located next to a highway hidden behind other buildings and one can only have an idea of its size and magnificent proportions when viewed from a nearby pedestrian bridge uh, from the construction and uh, yes it's in essence it's a play with light light used as a as a constructive element the symbolism of the cross is present in the very plan it's a creation this is one of the most aware inspiring thing i've seen in a minute I'm not an overtly religious, but I can see finding God being relatively easy in a place like this. Somebody wrote this. You know, I, I, I would agree when the building is very creative, uh, you don't need uh, instructions or to read guides or whatever. It, 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 it inspires you, feel it in your heart that it's a building that, um, that uh, you know, has a spiritual significance. And yes, there is, it is a cathedral. Now this is a, a, a gymnasium, which unfortunately was risking demolition and I hope it was not demolished. A great gymnasium, look at this. You know, it's like a wild architectural animal. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, Kenzo Tange was not a timid creator. In fact, no creator is timid. You are either a creator or you are a timid person. In, in creativity, you cannot be timid. Many creators were actually in the, the day, day, daily life timid. There were great artists who were very timid, but not in their work. Uh, Pete, uh, Pete Mondrian was so timid that he would even if he wouldn't dance with a woman. He just couldn't dance with a woman. He was shy. He was timid, but not in his beautiful paintings. The idea is not to be timid in your work. You can be otherwise quite timid and shy. It's okay, but not in your work. In your work, you are supposed to be courageous. 
as God himself was courageous, wasn't he, when he created the world. And it's not a perfect world, let's, not, let's tell the truth, but the creator was courageous. Anyway, the gymnasium. The gymnasium which risked of being demolished, and I hope it was not demolished, Uh, those who do not appreciate creativity, of course, they are the enemies of such creations because they, they, uh, they, they provoke you with a heroic uh, uh, spirit. As you can see, it was not very well kept. But everything here is brilliant. Look at the structure. I mean, just compare this building with everything around it. It's like a temple. Yamanashi Press and Broadcasting Center, another heroic building from 1967. Look at this. You know, it's a building that uh, expresses this power, economic power, and the desire of the Japanese to, to stand out and to, to communicate with the world. This was a broadcasting center from 1967, uh, a very sculptural and, um, again, ro robust building. Yamanashi Broadcasting Center. I particularly like this picture because this building by, by Kenzo Tange is in between the base, which is with this, you know, uh, these houses, this. Uh, low-key buildings and the majestic mountains in the background. So the, the building by, by Kenzo Tange is uh, making the transition from the, the you know, the pedestrian, um, you know, uh, appearance of the buildings at the bottom and, uh, and the heroic uh, stance of the mountains. And it is a heroic building, his, his own as well. The Fuji Broadcasting Center from 1919. Uh, this is a much newer uh, work, and that's why I want to show, show you. He himself changed. In my opinion, this building is superior from 1960, whatever, 1963. And this building, which was built in 1990, well, he was already an older man. It's true. <clears throat> Japan was not the same one. I think this building is more decorative in a way. Yes, it has uh, that sphere there, but all in all, this building doesn't have the same energy as this building, in my opinion. So it shows some kind of a decline in his case as well. And maybe it was uh, unavoidable. And it's through those years, the 80s and 90s were fatal for architecture. Many, many, many problems around that time. Postmodernism manifested itself then. Uh, of course, they, they, they still had, uh, you know, interesting things, but uh, I don't know. In my opinion, this is a weaker building than, uh, than his earlier works. This one, uh, this one uh, is an earlier work, actually, from uh, early 70s, I think, or late 60s. And it's a tower, and it's uh, very audacious. Look at this. You know, this is the country of earthquakes, right? <laughs> well, looking at this building, you wouldn't say it. <clears throat> you wouldn't say this is the country of earthquakes. But how come the Japanese can ignore the, uh, the, the, the earthquake, earthquakes? The Japanese miracle was based, as I already said, on, on, a, on a country that understood that technology is unavoidable. So they tried to achieve excellence in the field of technology. 
And they had uh, luck because they did so, but they were also anchored in the old mythologies of their own culture. So they were always, they, they, they were rooted. These people were rooted. It didn't matter how futuristic they were in their attempts at technology. They still, there was always a spiritual side to, the, to their lives, connecting them to, the, to those roots. And uh, this is something that um, many countries do not have, but Japan still has. It's easy to be futuristic when you are strongly anchored, like, uh, let's say, an oak, when your roots are spreading uh, deep and wide into a soil which is nourished by the oldest intuitions and myths and spirit. Anyway, in September, uh, God willing, I will make an even more ample presentation today. I, you know, I also have one to present the other two architects, so I will rush a little bit. Uh, but uh, I think it's, a, it's a, an introduction in the work of one of the most important modern architects, that is uh, Kenzo Tange. <clears throat> even uh, Kenneth Frampton uh, stated that uh, despite the fact that Japan has, uh, you know, present day, the day stars like Toyohito, Kazuyo Sejima, Ishigami, Su Fujimoto and others, he claims that uh, the, the period in which Kenzo Tange started to work was more uh, significant, more fruitful. And I, I believe uh, Frampton is right. But times changed, as I said. Now I'm sure many Japanese know a lot about champagne. At the time when Kenzo Tange in the 60s, 50s, early 70s functioned, uh, people had other things to do. Now look at this city hall in Tokyo. You saw the earliest uh, city halls that he built. He built a few, you saw two or three. But look at this one, 1991. Can you believe it? It's a different Japan, it's a different Tokyo. It's a mega city, a metropolitan city that almost forgot perhaps to an extent the, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, tragedies the city hall here is, um, uh, I don't know, it's, it, 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 it has an emphasis on, on, on dimensions that uh, I find problematic. I actually don't think this work is, uh, is, uh, is, is some of his best at all. But I understand the bureaucratic machinery at the level of a city like Tokyo had to be uh, housed in a, in a building of certain dimensions. But somehow I have a feeling that is, something is missing here, a vision, and I don't know, it's a big city, it's a big uh, building, but uh, I, I think uh, Kenzo Tange uh, um, diminished himself uh, towards the end of his life. Well, at that time he was all, almost uh, 80, and um, I don't know. I don't know if it's just about the age. I don't know. I look at uh, his house now, uh, the first house he built for himself and look at this building. Uh, you know, it's a different Japan. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a Japan where the heroic uh, uh, dimensions of life here are mimicked in a way through the bigness of the building. But, but as uh, Einstein said, in life, what counts cannot be counted, and what can be counted doesn't count. So it's not about quantity, it's not about dimensions, it's about the inner quality. And the inner quality of this building, in my opinion, is not, is not very impressive. Here it is, and not just because it's a smaller building. Now, him, and we are approaching the end of this introduction in his work because it's no more than an introduction. He also worked significantly as an urbanist and he proposed urban uh, schemes that were considered uh, utopian. He was part of the metabolist uh, movement. Uh, he proposed, he made proposals to extend Tokyo on water, uh, you know, 
this utopic uh, activity is important. And I would uh, invite the students and the young architects, and not just the young architects, every architect to honor your uh, path in your life by not forgetting your dreams. If you want to propose, I don't know what, the ideal village or a city on the Black Sea, or I don't know what, even a flying city, do it. Do it if you truly believe in your ideas. Don't remain at the level of being the slave of I don't know what little office who abu which abuses you, or I don't know what so little, you know, some so-called beneficiaries. Think big, but not when, when I mean what I mean by think big is not to address necessarily big, uh, you know, because as I said, architecture is about quality, it's not about quantity. It's about the audacity of your thought and your feeling about that uh, inner quality, which must be kept alive and not kept, not only kept alive, but nourished to develop just like a flower. You have to pour water, orient the flower towards the sunlight and then the flower will, will, will smile and will be happy and it will, uh, it will grow appropriately. So, you know, for in the context of Japan, Kenzo Tange pro made some proposals. They didn't come into being, but, but it, kept, it, it kept nourishing, you know, the, the, the ethos of the country. You know, the architects of the country got inspired by the idealism of some of their architects. He was not the only one. Here we see, uh, you know, uh, some kind of a water uh, urbanism, uh, also inspired by the traditions of whatever he said, that architecture is not supposed to be, you know, uh, connected with tradition. You see clearly, especially in the foreground, you know, because of the roofing, that this is Japan. This is, this is uh, connected with the past of Japan. Not in all schemes, like here, for example, now. Here he is, you know, contemplating because he was indeed, he was an architect, but he was also an urbanist. I think he studied both architecture and, and, and urbanism. Hello, Mr. Tange, you died 16 years ago on this day. And we saw that building he built for the Olympics. Design philosophy. Tange did not imagine himself as a leading form giver. He sees himself in a state of transition. I don't know who wrote this, but I like the word transition. The role of tradition is that of a catalyst, which furthers a chemical reaction, but is no longer detectable in the end result. That's what he thought. He also contributed in the metab metabolism movement. Many metabolists had studied under Kenzo Tange at Tokyo University's Tange Laboratory. That's it. So now I go to the second architect I will talk about today, a uh, uh, less spectacular one. The, the next two presentations would be significantly shorter and, uh, and um, maybe we'll have a little bit of time to, to talk a little. I will talk now about this um, architect I, he, I myself didn't know anything about until yesterday. And uh, my presentation is, is not as rich as probably should have been. Nicolas Henri Jardin, he was born today. He was born on the same year with the great uh, Piranesi. And uh, he even had an admiration and I think studied with Piranesi. But he was French, Nicolas Henri Jardin. So Nicolas Henri Jardin, a neoclassical architect, was born in Saint Germain de Noyer uh, and worked 17 years in Denmark as an architect to the royal court. He introduced neoclassicism to Denmark. Here he was. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I like the way these architects used to dress, you know, uh, much more romantically than we do. Anyway, this was, unfortunately, this picture is not so good. It was a proposal for uh, the tomb of, of someone, but I, I like this page. It almost looks like an alchemical, a Kabbalistic kind of, uh, of, of, of project. Too bad I don't have a big, uh, bigger resolution picture. Yellow Mansion in Copenhagen, 1764, 1767, so 250 years ago. 
it's a building an herbal bin, building in in Copenhagen the the, the yellow uh, the yellow building uh, it's a different kind of building from what we saw in Japan by Kenzo Tange of course but it you know it was built 250 years ago uh, let's let's call this uh, neoclassical uh, architecture built in uh, in Denmark but built by a French architect house family name means garden, Jardin. Nice name, Jardin. Nicolas Henri Jardin. Uh, okay, interior work at uh, this one. I don't know if I have pictures. Uh, it was burned down in burned down in 1794, so we don't have pictures. Redesign of the Fredensborg, Fredensborg Palace Garden and Park. Uh, along with this other person, uh, 1759. Uh, here I have more pictures. It's a royal palace, actually. And uh, he did the gardens. Many architects at that time worked on the buildings, worked on the gardens, worked on the interior design. They did everything. I don't know if here he worked also on the buildings. It's still unclear to me, but let's assume he did, or let's assume he didn't. He worked on the gardens. Now, I, I don't know if the gardens are exactly as they were 250 years ago. I don't know. But this is in Denmark, it's not in France. In France, he had troubles because when he returned to France, the French Revolution happened and uh, he had to retire at his country state, I read. Anyway, a different architecture, of course, from what we saw in Japan, but beauty is beauty and sculptures and uh, trees and the blue sky uh, always inspire. This is, um, you know, the complex of buildings is quite a big, uh, quite a big estate. And you can tell this is not France, although he was a French architect and although he practiced neoclassical architecture, somehow you have the feeling that this is not France and it's not. And it, 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 there is something Scandinavian here. What could that be? I don't know. I have this feeling. I mean, I know, of course, it is in, in, in Denmark. So you take the same you know, the same aesthetics, neoclassicism, and a neoclassical building in France is different from a neoclassical building in Denmark. The question is why? Redesign of summer residence at this palace, Bernstorff Place, a palace. Uh, the gardens he designed as well. It's a smaller, uh, smaller residence for a count, uh, and uh, you know an engraving from that time. Uh, then you see some pictures of the building now. Here it is, very well kept. The redesign of this castle for this count, uh, Gottlob uh, Moltke. Uh, I don't know, this one is a little bit uh, pale for my taste and uh, rigid, but uh, who knows, maybe also because it's not touched by the sunlight. Um, but the trees behind it are, are <laughs> generous. And so is this picture is a different, uh, it's actually a different building that it's not very clear if he continued the work on the building or just on the landscape around the building. The interior work at this, uh, again, the Count Adam uh, estate at Breckenved, 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 no pictures, re re rebuilding of, of, of this uh, estate, of this uh, castle, or I don't know how to call it, of the same Count. Here it is with a great uh, landscape around it. Uh, I love this wild uh, landscaping. It, it's more bucolic, this one. So this architect was born today, the 22nd of March, about um, 
in fact, uh, 300 years ago, in 1720. And I think we are approaching the end of this presentation and I'm happy to end, yes, with a cousin of Le Corbusier, in my opinion, a very interesting man and he deserves a better, a better, uh, uh, better PowerPoint presentation on him because uh, I have a feeling that uh, he's called the other genre because Le Corbusier was also a genre, Charles Edouard genre, but this is Pierre genre and I have the, he's called the other the other genre, and in my opinion, this other genre uh, living in the shadow of Charles Edouard Genre, meaning Le Corbusier, uh, still hides from us not because he wants to, because he lived uh, uh, you know under you know in, in in the shadow of Le Corbusier, he still hides from us. I think his his own richness. Uh, he, his own contribution to the architecture of Le Corbusier. And I just, I learned today that actually Chandigarh, that is known as the work of Le Corbusier, apparently uh, the role of Pierre Gendre was much bigger than, uh, than I thought and than most people think. Uh, and you'll see some buildings built by Pierre Gendre in Chandigarh, but I will not show the works which are famous, uh, famously done by, uh, by his more famous uh, cousin. He, <clears throat> he died at uh, 71, born in, he was younger than, uh, than uh, Le Corbusier, but I, I don't know, uh, I think Le Corbusier was born in 1887. So there, there was um, uh, nine years difference between them or so. So Pierre Genre was a Swiss architect who collaborated with his cousin, Charles Edouard Genre, who assumed the pseudonym Le Corbusier for about 20 years. So they worked together. They, they actually opened their own office together. They, they ran an architecture office that was called, uh, you know, Genre and Le Corbusier or Corbusier Genre. Uh, so his role was important. In 1922, the Genre cousins, meaning uh, Pierre Genre and Le Corbusier, set up an architectural practice together. From 1927 to 1937, they worked together with Charlotte Perion, a brilliant uh, French woman in the office of Le Corbusier. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> at the, at the, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm, lo I'm losing my, my voice. My voice. So at the Le Corbusier Pierre Genre studio on Rue de Sèvres, that was the office of, uh, of Le Corbusier. Uh, when, but they worked together from 1927 to 1937 for 10 years. That office was called Le Corbusier Pierre Genre. In 1929, the trio, meaning Le Corbusier Pierre Genre and Charlotte Perion, prepared the house fitting section for the decorative artist exhibition and asked for a group stand, renewing and widening the 1928 avant-garde group idea. This was refused by the decorative artist, artist committee. They resigned and founded the Union of Modern Artists. And here I, I will stop for a minute to, to invite the students or the people who are now present here to also organize yourselves in, in groupings, to create an avant-garde, to create a movement, to create something, something that is yours, original, something that belongs to your time and place. This will give you an identity, a sense of belonging. You know, to be, you belong to a group of people who together with you, you, you move in a certain direction of thought and action because thought by itself is not enough. So these people, you know, they, just like the metabolists in Japan and Kenzo Tange, they had something to say. It was something, uh, in, you know, important to say. And, and for that reason, they came together because alone you cannot do as much as you can do with other people, especially when you try to promote an idea uh, that is, uh, you know, that's why the Dada movement came into being, <clears throat> they still Bauhaus, Cubism, you name them, you know, it was always 
uh, a, a group of people that um, you know uh, advanced some ideas which were considered at the time avant-garde. <clears throat> the cousins, the two, later designed many buildings, including a number of villas and vacation houses and renovating existing buildings as well. I didn't know about this renovation business, but it's possible. The working relationship ended when Pierre, and this is very important, Pierre joined the French resistance to the Nazis, while Le Corbusier worked with the Vichy government, a collaborationist regime to the to Nazi, Nazi Germany. Now, we, I have the highest respect and love for Le Corbusier, but on this I am on the side of Pierre. I think Pierre was more noble than Le Corbusier. Pierre didn't want to flirt with those in power in order to get commissions. He turned his back on the, on the, on the government that, that collaborated with the Nazi Germany while Le Corbusier didn't. And that's why they broke up. The working relationship ended when Pierre joined the French resistance. And I love this about Pierre. He joined the French resistance, but not Le Corbusier. In my opinion, Le Corbusier was a weaker man than Pierre, at least at, at the level of this, uh, this affair. And it's not, a, it's not an uh, unimportant matter. But they collaborated once again after the war on the plan and architecture for the new town of Chandigarh in India. And maybe I should have had here those buildings as well, but, but that story has a level of complexity which would have uh, created the uh, uh, some uh, some additional problems for me. So I, I just concentrated on the work of, uh, of Pierre, uh, Pierre Gendre. So let's remember, Pierre Gendre was the cousin of Le Corbusier, younger, with about 10 years younger. They were together, and it's clear that Le Corbusier valued Pierre Gendre. Uh, Otherwise, I mean, you know, Le Corbusier was not a man to associate himself with anyone. No, no way at all. Obviously, uh, he valued and respected uh, Pierre Gendre, and I think he had all the reasons to. Here he is in a, um, you know, <laughs> a foggy picture a little bit, uh, and uh, <laughs> there's a little uh, sculpture there, which is very interesting. I don't know if he did it. He doesn't look like a very relaxed man. It does look a little bit like Le Corbusier. Uh, anyway, um, an interesting character, and actually I'm very interested in him. I would like to know more about him. I only discovered some of his buildings that he built in India, and he also built a lot of chairs, a lot of furniture designs he did. He was considered a visionary furniture maker, and indeed he, he had some, uh, some very inspired uh, uh, designs. Smoking, I don't know if I saw Le Corbusier smoking, but uh, his cousin was smoking. And uh, as opposed to Le Corbusier, he remained in uh, Chandigarh after the buildings were finalized. The, you know, the, uh, the political uh, buildings that belong to the government of, of Chandigarh that, that, that uh, Le Corbusier built. But as I said, it wasn't just Le Corbusier. Um, another picture of him. Uh, and uh, yeah, he's smiling here. Then what do you think this is? What do you think this is? Well, maybe it's not so difficult to, 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 to see what it is. Is You know, he's sitting on a bicycle. So you see the, the, the seat of the bicycle. And uh, yeah, it's a picture of him on the bicycle in front of one of the buildings built for the Shandigar complex. Um, here he is. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Genre. I love your bike. It's a beautiful, uh, you know, old style bike. Um, I, I love old bicycles. It's true. Old bicycles are magical. And so uh, this is uh, Pierre Genre. That, you know, I think he deserved better than to be just named the other Genre or the cousin of Le Corbusier. No, he was his own man and, and different from Le Corbusier. And here they are together, Le Corbusier on the left and on the right standing um, uh, Pierre Gendre. And we should know about Pierre Gendre, and not because he was just, because he was the cousin of Le Corbusier, but because 
he had something to say, and uh, I think his buildings are not inferior actually to Le Corbusier, but I couldn't find too many of them on the web. Here they are again, <laughs> you know, of course, the, the older and more cocky Le Corbusier is on the left and Pierre Jean Ray, the younger one on the right. But I think they got along well, and uh, I still respect more Pierre Jean Ray for his choice in political matters. The fact that he joined the French resistance movement against the Nazis, as opposed to Monsieur uh, Le Corbusier. Anyway, some drawings, uh, mainly about um, uh, French, uh, uh, not French, furniture designs. As you can see, a chair and uh, <clears throat> other chairs and uh, other chairs. He drew, <laughs> he made many chairs, some of them quite interesting. Uh, unfortunately, many had been destroyed in India, but uh, they can still be found. You probably could even buy one on eBay. You just search for a Pierre Jean Ray chair and you'll probably find it. Uh, on, on eBay, you can find anything. Uh, you can find pieces of furniture by uh, or designs by Charlotte Perion, who was the, the third partner in that uh, grouping with Le Corbusier, Pierre Jean Ray, and Charlotte Perion. You can buy a lamp designed by Charlotte Perion for with about 50 euros. You can, if you have a little bit of money and you know you eat a little bit less, uh, you can buy a present for someone dear with a, a lamp by Charlotte Perion. Uh, you can find them on, on eBay. This is a chair that you are going to, to see, uh, you know, in real life, so to speak. Uh, this is just the drawing. And this one, I don't see at all what's going on here. Anyway, <clears throat> there was a symposium in memory of Pierre Jean Ray some years ago, and I found this, this, the plans of this house, which, which are not bad at all, and they have nothing to do with Le Corbusier. Uh, and I don't know if it is, uh, no, it's not a house. I see there an amphitheater. Uh, I don't know exactly what it is, but it, these were done by, uh, by Pierre Jean Ray, but this, this building was not built. But you can see already that we are dealing here not with a you know, timid figure living in the shadow of Le Corbusier, but with an original uh, uh, architect and designer, architect. So we'll look at some buildings by uh, Pierre Jean Ray. This is a memorial for Gandhi in India. And uh, it's, it's, it's a fine building, you know. I, I could have thought it was done by Le Corbusier. No, it was done by Pierre Jean Ray and just by him without uh, his cousin. And I think it's a fine building. Hey, look at this, you know, it, it has a freshness, a vision. And yeah, maybe you can see a little bit of the influence of Charles Edouard Jean Ray, meaning his cousin, but uh, no, it's, 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 it, it, it is Jean Ray's building, Pierre Jean Ray's building for Gandhi. What a nice, um, you know, uh, subject. So he's a man most of the time, uh, most of the people do not know of, but he deserves to be known. And he was born today, as I said, the 22nd of March. probably built also this building here uh, on the left. He built many buildings in Shandigar. I just, I couldn't find too many pictures, but I have some. Um, so um, it is towards, we are towards the end of our presentation. Please be patient a little bit. Uh, Pierre Jean Ray house. This is a very nice house he built, which is the museum Pierre Jean Ray in Shandigar. And, uh, you know, looking at it, uh, yes, it's a little bit more reticent than the buildings by uh, Le Corbusier, but uh, it has values which maybe the buildings of Le Corbusier don't, uh, a certain uh, clan d'oeil towards the past. You know, it, it's, it's not a bad building. 
I, I like it. It's different than Le Corbusier. Yes, it's more uh, simple in a way, less, uh, you know, extravagant, but uh, in a way more human. And the interior is, uh, has some uh, brilliant parts you are going to see. So this was his own house, Pierre Jandre's house. Look at this chair here in the foreground. It looks very interesting, no? With uh, woven parts, with the wires, uh, you know, and uh, it was built by him and he is looking at something there and, you know, in his, inside his house. He was a dreamer, but also a man of action. And it seems that yeah. what we know of Chandigarh with the buildings by Le Corbusier, he had a major role there. And also there were two architects, two British architects who helped him. And then, today, yes. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, this chair it's uh, based on a, a traditional Indian uh, farmer farmer's bed. You can see it on the right side in this picture. Uh, that's a traditional uh, Indian uh, bed uh, a farmer weaves. Like uh, he he does with jute strings, and it's a a, a square uh, frame with these kind of legs. And he's taken the same thing and made this chair on the left hand side. Yeah, thank you, Vatsal. Uh, it's a, it's a good uh, good information, and I had this feeling, yes, that uh, it is inspired by the local uh, local traditions. But what I learned today, actually, to my amazement, and unfortunately I lost the link, uh, I have to find it again. That apparently Le, Le Corbusier uh, had some uh, bad 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 habit. He he didn't. Uh, uh, acknowledge uh, easily uh, people who contributed significantly to some of his works. And apparently in Chandigarh, there was already a team of architects, an, um, uh, an American architect and the Polish architect who worked on the scheme with, and apparently Le Corbusier didn't change much. That's what I read, but I have to verify and actually, uh, the construction process and all the, the intricacies that were necessary there involved very much the man we will see in the picture, Pierre Jandre. Now, myself, when I presented the works in Chandigarh, I presented them as belonging totally to Le Corbusier, but it appears it was not the case. There were other people involved, first Pierre Jandre, but then also that couple that initially they started the Shandigar process uh, uh, and uh, the planning. And then uh, one, the, the Polish architect died in a, in a plane accident. And, and, and that's when, and the other one left. And that's when Le Corbusier was called in. I have to read more carefully about it, but it's an interesting story. And it, it, it says that actually, and it's something I suspected that, you know, even the greatest creators, they didn't work alone. There were other people involved, people often we don't know of. And in the case of married, you know, great architects, sometimes their wives had a great impact on their works and we don't talk about that and we should talk about that. Like for example, the two wives of Alvarado who, you know, contributed significantly to his works. But we only talk of, of him and there are other, other, other examples. Anyway, so this is the interior of the house by, uh, by uh, where he lived, actually, uh, Pierre Jeanre. Uh, I've heard the voice. Um, anyway, if you want to say something, please, please do so. Now, it's, I think it's a more human, uh, maybe more predictable house than, than what uh, his more well-known cousin did, but, but still, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting and, you know, there is color and, uh, you know, there are also parts of the building like right here on the right that, that uh, connect with a certain tradition of the place. And you are going to see other houses be because he designed many houses in Chandigarh. So, you know, he didn't just work for the governmental buildings, but also designed uh, uh, various other buildings. But this is his own house. And uh, it's, it's more hybrid than what uh, Le Corbusier did, but I wouldn't say it's, it's uh, without virtues. And uh, I mean, look even the handrail of this stair and uh, <clears throat> the, the colors, I mean, all that, that blue wall, 
And it, it's not bad. I, I think it's good. And he was truly a remarkable furniture designer. So these are the plants. Um, it's called, uh, I think it's called in a certain way. Uh, he, no, he, he created these houses, maybe including his own, some kind of a type or typ typical house that, that was supposed to be repeated for various people. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> he has many types from what I read, but I couldn't find pictures for all of them, only some of them. There is apparently an archive, Pierre Jandré, at the Centre d'Architecture in, uh, in uh, Montreal, uh, the Canadian Center for, uh, for Architecture. So his architecture is more gentle, more sweet, more human, a little bit than what uh, Le Corbusier did. Apparently less heroic. Here we see that, uh, you know, more traditional chair that uh, Vatsal mentioned. This is a chair that he designed, and we'll, we are going to see a few others. It's also interesting that he remained in India. Uh, well, he died, uh, he returned to France when he died, but he remained for a longer, much longer time in, in Chandigarh in India after Le Corbusier left. I think he left India. So he's called the other genre, the first one being, of course, Le Corbusier, these are some houses that he built or they built. It's not very clear to me, but I think they are interesting. From that time, the 50s in Chandigarh. You see the type 13J house in Chandigarh by Pierre Jeanre. Uh, he designed various types, and I think they were meant for, uh, you know, multiplication. So these are not done by Le Corbusier, but by Pierre Genre. Houses for peons uh, under construction, sector 23 in Chandigarh. Uh, I, I love this picture, you know, with the simple means, you know, but... Uh, the architecture is both new and old somehow, you know, it's, it's, it's an architecture that is inspiring to me because it looks both ways somehow. Another type, 5J in sector 16, Chandigarh also built by him. And it's interesting in a way to compare what he did with what the mentor, so to speak, did, that is Le Corbusier. His architecture is more uh, gentle somehow, more human, you know, it's not so animated by, uh, you know, extravagant ideas. And I, I, I value this. Now, it wasn't very clear to me if this is the opera from Chandigar, but it's another building by, uh, by uh, Pierre Jeanre, and it's not bad. You know, it's, yes, it's a small building. It's not the opera in Sydney. It's not, uh, you know, uh, flamboyant as operas usually are, but it has a nobility uh, and, uh, you know, a freshness of vision and the materiality, the materials that are used I like it. It's it's modest, but it's nice, I think. I wish I found more pictures. Now look at this building. It's a little canteen, you know, a place to eat in Chandigarh, and it was ab abandoned for many years, totally in, in, in you know in disarray, and it was it was uh, brought back to life. Here it is. Pierre Jeanre. Not bad. I like it very much, you know, a little structure, a little pavilion, so to speak, but it's nice. And I think even the tree likes it or the trees. So he was not, uh, as I used to, to think in the past, because I knew of him, I thought he was the engineer, you know, the calculating uh, prosaic man who was unable to 
draw and without imagination. No, not at all. Pierre, Pierre Jeanre had, and I understood when he was studying art and architecture, he was a brilliant uh, artist. He painted, he sculpted, he did architecture. So he had an artistic side that was distinctly his. And I, I imagine Le Corbusier appreciated him very much. Maybe he loved him. And I think he deserved to be loved by the much no, better known uh, you know, genius, so to speak. But sometimes, you know, there are people, uh, both in our lives and in the history of art and architecture, that do not have glorious positions, but they, 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 they have a role in culture. And so did Pierre Jeanre. I like this little pavilion very much. I think it's excellent. Some furniture designs, and with this, we'll end today the presentation. Uh, so, that this is how. <laughs> This is how, at one point, and I read uh, the people of Chandigarh, either they decided uh, some kind of a, it was some kind of a collective decision to discard many modernistic uh, uh, structures or, or furnitures uh, built by the foreigners. So that's how they discarded so many chairs by uh, Pierre Jeanre, although you know, later on, they, they understood that Jean Ray contributed to, to Chandigarh significantly, and he loved India. So India, uh, I mean, they restored his own house and they transported it into a museum. And now many people think that actually Chandigarh belongs to Pierre Jean Ray. I, 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 I found such an expression, such words. So this is a chair I understood. They, were, they are very, very well built. And they are very difficult to destroy. And at one point, some scholars or I don't know, some students traveled to India from the West to rescue pieces of furniture by uh, Pierre Jean Ray. And they found many of them discarded, but, but in a good condition because they, they didn't break. They were, I mean, let us not forget, Pierre Jean Ray was Swiss. And the Swiss make things very well, as you I'm sure know. So there, the chair couldn't be easily destroyed, even discarded, even if discarded. This one as well, you know, it's well crafted of good quality wood. And I'm sure India had and has a good craftsmen. So it was built, uh, you know, uh, uh, well. And, I, you know, it seems this, this piece also can, uh, can uh, can be brought horizontally. It's, it, they're interesting, you know, they're a little bit cubistic. Uh, they're nice, even this bench. And apparently they are very valued uh, these days, you know, uh, furniture designs by Pierre Genre. So even if you live in the, in the shadow of the big tree, you know, to, to, to quote from uh, the justification Le Corbusier found, uh, Brinkwish found when he refused to work for Rodin, Auguste Rodin, when he said in the shadow of the big tree, grass does not grow. Well, it looks like grass does grow. Pierre Jean Ray did grow in the shadow of the so-called big tree called Le Corbusier. And, and, and grew with his own distinctive voice. And bravo to him for this. And I think this is the last image on, uh, on Pierre Jandre. And let's wish him a happy birthday. It's a table. And maybe on such table, he produced some drawings. And from those drawings, some houses came into being, and some chairs, and some other pieces of uh, furniture. Thank you very much. <laughs>